you, um, if you have your Bible with you, um, you can open it to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, excuse me, that's not where we're going. Let me find the other one here. We are going to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 31. And uh, we're going to be looking today at a subject that came up because somebody came forward in a service about three weeks ago and, and just said, I'm just having trouble with anger. I'm just lashing out at people. I'm just having some real struggles with that. And so I assured him that I would speak about this in the upcoming weeks. And so today's the day. And the, uh, the, the, the question is, how to get rid of anger? How do we get rid of our anger? And so we're going to look at this because that's exactly what the Bible tells us to do. Now, the world is a little confused about this because the world doesn't tell you to get rid of your anger. The world tells you to manage your anger. It's kind of popular today when people have anger problems. They want to send you to an anger management class. Any, anybody in here ever been through an anger management class? How'd that work out for you? It doesn't work out very good. Most people are angry in the class, okay? <laughs> anger management does not work. You know why? Because the Bible never told us to manage our anger. You can't manage your anger. It will manage you. You got to get rid of that stuff. And that's what the Bible tells us to do here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 31. Paul wrote this. And this is what he wrote, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is God speaking to us through the pen of the ancient apostle Paul. This is what he wrote, get rid of, not manage, but what? Get rid of. Here's another thing people want to do with their anger. Just stuff it, right? Just push your way down inside. Bite your tongue. Hold your temper. Just kind of stuff it down inside. Does God tell us to do that? No, we're going to see in a little while that God says that's foolish. Get rid of all, and then he lists some things, bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Now, if you read that list of things that God says to get rid of there, you will find that every one of them is one degree or another, one intensity, level of intensity or another of anger. Bitterness, what's at the bottom of that? Anger. What about rage? What fuels that? Anger. And then he just calls it anger. Brawling, what calls every public disturbance, every brawl? Anger. What about slander? Trash talking other people. Anger. And what about malice? Malice is just ill will for somebody. I hope they get what they deserve. What causes that? Anger. You see, all of this is one form or another, different degrees of anger. And what does God say to do? Get rid of it. Recently, <clears throat> one of God's sons confided to me that he was struggling with such a degree of anger that it was causing him to lash out at others. I told you that. And without words, his eyes pleaded <laughs> for an answer to that question, how do I get rid of anger? In order to understand how to get rid of anger we first need to define anger you don't even know what it is you're trying to get rid of if you can't define it you get that a word is meaningless to you unless you can put a definition to it so let's define anger anger is a spontaneous negative emotional reaction against someone or something that we perceive has wronged us or has wronged someone or something that we care about and now what anger is it's that negative, it's usually spontaneous, it just usually jumps up on you and grabs you suddenly and unexpectedly, it's spontaneous, and it's negative. How many of you ever did just the, the best thing you have ever done when you were angry? Some of you are here because of your anger, right? You did some stupid stuff while you were angry? And get that. So it's that negative, spontaneous, negative emotional reaction against someone or maybe something that we perceive that has wronged us. Or maybe they have wronged someone or something that we care about. But it's that negative emotional response to that. In today's American court system, judges 
often require offenders who have committed violent crimes as a result of uncontrolled anger to attend these anger management classes. And as I said, these almost never work. They're almost always ineffective. You might get a few good things out of them, but overall, if you're trying to manage your anger, that's not God's solution, so it's not going to be effective. Those who try to manage their anger soon discover that they can't. It manages them. It causes them to do stuff that they otherwise wouldn't do. And the reason is that God hasn't instructed us to manage it. He tells us to get rid of it. That's what Paul wrote. Ephesians 4.31. I just can't hammer this into you enough. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. So we need to get that. He wrote, get rid of all anger. Not some of it, but how much of it? All of it. Now, in order to get rid of of all anger we must first understand that anger is a surface problem indicating that we have not properly dealt with one or more root problems in our lives and so we're going to spend the rest of the time in this sermon briefly examining four common root problems that are revealed by the surface problem of anger you know you know what i mean by a surface problem I love to use this analogy because I'm a country boy. Here's the, here's the deal. A surface problem is like a dandelion in your garden. How many of you got some dandelions in your garden? A dandelion in your garden. That's the surface. That, that dandelion, those leaves and that little yellow flower and those little fuzzy things that blow in the wind, that's the surface problem. What happens if you just deal with the surface problem? Just take your hoe and cut that dandelion off right at ground level. You say, well, I took care of that. Did you? <laughs> it's going to be back in about three days, right? And you cut it off again. You deal with the surface problem. What's going to happen in about three days? It's going to be back again. The only way to get rid of that surface problem continually is you got to deal with the root problem. As long as the root is there, the surface problem will come back. The root problem has to be dealt with in order for us to get rid of the surface problem of anger. And I find in Scripture and just in practical life situations that there are four root causes of anger. And if you deal with the root cause, you can deal with the surface cause permanently. You can deal with it on an ongoing basis until you let another root get in there. Then you got to deal with that. So you see, anger being a surface problem should actually be used as an indicator that I need to deal with a root problem. Most people, when they get angry, they want to deal with the anger. And, and, and that's not the problem. The root problem that's causing the anger, that's what you need to deal with. Do you see that? And so we don't, need to, we don't need to buy into the world's business of trying to manage our anger. But we get that from the world from the time we're little kids, right? When you were a little kid and you threw a temper tantrum, didn't your parents give you some advice about how to manage that anger? Yeah, they whipped you. <laughs> okay? You know, most parents, are like, after they've whipped you, they'll set you down and they'll say, now, when you feel yourself getting angry, you count to 10. You ever heard that? The old count to 10 method. You can count to 10 million and still be angry. Mathematics is not the solution to anger. You get that? Counting never works. Sometimes if your anger is expressed by saying stuff that you shouldn't say, and your parents would say, bite your tongue, as if that's going to take care of your anger. You can chew your tongue off and still be angry. You get that? So we've always been taught to, you know, to deal with our anger in ways that God never said to deal with it. So let's talk about what the Bible really says about dealing with your anger. Let's talk about four root causes of anger. The first one is what I call personal rights. You know what I mean by personal rights? You claiming some right, and then somebody steps on that right. Somebody violates that right, and what happens? You get angry. A lot of you are living in <clears throat> group settings, and you're kind of in close quarters, and, 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 and maybe a brother or a sister gets in your face and really talks to you, really trash talks you. What's your response going to be? Anger, why? Because I've got a right to be talked to better than that. I got a right to my personal space. Get out of my face. Isn't that it? We're claiming some personal right. And when somebody steps on that right, then the natural response is 
anger. It's not the spiritual response, but it's the natural response. The natural response is anger. You see, here's what we need to learn about that root problem of claiming some right. As believers, we are slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that over and over again. Paul explained that we became his slaves, that's Christ's slaves, when he bought us out of the slave market of sin. He talked about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 20. He said, you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now that Greek phrase, you were bought at a price, was taken directly from the Roman culture of the first century. It was used to describe the transaction that took place when a wealthy Roman citizen went down to the slave market to purchase a slave. When the price had been agreed on and the transaction had been closed and all the paperwork had been done, then the wealthy Roman would announce to his new slave, you were bought at a price. You are now my slave. I own you. So you see, an important aspect of the Christian's relationship with the Lord Jesus is that it is a master-slave relationship. And the simple fact is that slaves have no rights, only responsibilities. Do you get that? No rights, only responsibilities. Now, when you read through your Bible, you will find again and again and again that we are servants of Jesus. We are servants of the Lord. And because most English Bibles kind of gloss over that Greek word, slave. They'd rather call it servant because servant is a little more palatable. It's a little more socially acceptable to us today. But the Greek word is doulos and it means slave. How many rights do slaves have? None. And so if a slave doesn't have any rights, then what about us as Christians if we are slaves, if we are servants of the Lord Jesus, the one who bought us at a price, became our master. We are his slaves. When he bought us, he bought all of our rights. It was a package deal. So how many rights do we have? None. You get that? I don't have any rights. So if my master chooses to let you get in my face and trash talk me, whose responsibility is it to correct that? His, not mine. Because I don't have any rights. You get that? You say, but that fellow's wrong. Doesn't make any difference. You don't have any rights. And when we learn to surrender our rights, then we don't have to be angry. If I don't have the right to my personal space, somebody gets in my personal space, doesn't matter. If I don't have a right to be talked to in a certain way, and somebody doesn't talk to me that way, it doesn't matter. Do you understand that? Personal rights, as long as you're claiming a right, the devil will see to it that somebody steps on that right, and you're going to become angry, and the anger of man, the wrath of man, does not work the righteousness of God. When you are angry, you are never going to do what God wants you to do. That's what that verse means. So we need to understand that. So the solution to get ridding, uh, getting rid of anger that is a result of personal rights that have not been surrendered to God is to surrender those rights to him because you were bought at a price and slaves have no rights. So you need to picture yourself as if you were at an altar putting all of your rights on that altar and dedicating them to God, giving them to him, surrendering them to him because the more of those rights that you surrender to him, the less you're going to be angry because somebody stepped on them. If they're not your rights anyway and somebody steps on them, it won't make you angry. As long as you're claiming that right and somebody violates that right, you will be angry. Do you get that? Just surrender your rights because slaves don't have any rights. Now let's look at the next one. The next one I call expectations. And this is a big one. Expectations. Unmet expectations, they're just a big cause of anger. You see, we often make the mistake of placing our expectations in people. We expect them to act in certain ways or to do certain things. We expect them not to act in certain ways or not to do certain things. And then when they don't meet our expectations, what happens? We become angry. I like to give you this illustration. This is one of my favorite illustrations because it's so common. If you're married... You get that? 
or if you've got a, a fiance or a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you get off work at about 4.30 and she's expecting you to be at home for dinner and she has worked to prepare this nice dinner for you and right about 4.30, when the horn sounds at the factory and you're about to clock out and leave, some of the guys come up to you and they say, hey, let's go to the bar and have a few drinks. You didn't think I'd say that in church, did you? <laughs> but it happens, doesn't it? It happens, doesn't it? And so you're a worldly Christian, if you're a Christian at all, and you say, all right, I'll go with you guys for a little while. And your wife is at home with the dinner already warm on a stove, ready to serve it to you when, she, when you get there. And she's expecting you at about 5 o'clock, 5.30, and you're still not there. What's happening to her? She's beginning to get a little churn, isn't she? They're getting a little angry. 6 o'clock, and you still ain't there. She just turned it off. She don't care if it's warm or not. 6.30? She's already fed the kids, and the rest of it's going down the garbage disposal. Seven o'clock, she's packing your stuff. <laughs> Seven thirty, your stuff is out on the sidewalk, and the door is locked. What has happened? Why is she so angry? Unmet expectations. She expected you to do this, and you didn't meet her expectation, and she is fit to be tied. Is that it? So how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? How, how, how can she deal with that so that she doesn't get consumed with anger when you don't meet her expectations? There's only one way to deal with that. King David gave it to us in Psalm 62, verse number 5. My soul, wait silently for God alone. When you're waiting for somebody and they're not showing up when they're supposed to, are you silent? You're usually just spewing. But this says, my soul, wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. So where had David placed all of his expectations? In God alone. Here's why. God will always come through. God will, will always do exactly what he has said he will do. If God says, I will come home after work, I will be there by 5 o'clock, what will God do? He'll be there at 5 o'clock. You can never go wrong putting your expectations in God because God will always do what God says he's going to do. Human beings don't always do what God, what they say they're going to do, right? Sometimes they do, don't do it just because we're fallen, sinful creatures and we just decide not to do what we said we'll do. Sometimes it's beyond our control. Sometimes we intended to do it and we wanted to do it, but we just couldn't do it. Either way, when the expectation is not met, the other person is going to be angry. But you can never go wrong putting your expectations in God. Because he always does, and he always has the ability to do everything he says he'll do. But let me tell you something. Sometimes people get angry at God. Can we do a little sidetrack here? You ever been angry at God? Because God didn't meet your expectations? You know what the problem is there? False expectations. Sometimes we expect God to do stuff God never said he would do. Did you get that? Sometimes we, we say, oh man, um, you know, I think God wants me to do this and, 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 and I'm, I'm planning on doing that and I just know, I just know in my heart God wants me to do this. He's going to give me this opportunity to do this. And then you don't get the opportunity. And if you're not real careful, what will happen? You'll be mad at God because he didn't come through. Problem is, God never said he would let you have that opportunity. That's what you wanted, not what he wanted. And you're mad at God because you expected God to do something God never said he would do. You get that? Sometimes, sometimes I see this. I, I, see this I, 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 get, I get real concerned about some Christians in certain sections of the church today who, who want to who wanna put God in a position of doing what we want him to do instead of what he wants to do. You get that? The name it, claim it kind of stuff. Where we're trying, to, we're trying to almost back God in a corner. 
If I ask for it in Jesus' name, it's going to happen because we don't really understand what it means to ask for something in Jesus' name. And, and so we, we ask God to do something and we put that little magical formula on the end of it in Jesus' name and we think now God is obligated to do it. Listen, you can't obligate God to do anything. God is sovereign. God does what he wants to do. You say, but the Bible says if you ask for anything in his name, then he'll do it. Yeah, but you've got to understand what it means to ask in his name. When you're asking in his name, it means that you're asking for what he wants, not what you want. And when you're asking for something in his name, it means you're asking that it will happen the way he wants it to happen, and that when it happens, he gets the credit for it. That's what it means to do it in his name. So if I ask Jesus, Jesus, if you want me to do this, then you make it happen, because whatever you want, that's the supreme thing, not what I want. And so if I say what you want to happen here, you do it, and you do it in a way that it's obvious that you're doing it, and you get the credit for it, and you do what you want to do, that's asking in his name. Isn't that the way we're taught to pray in the beginning? When the Lord taught the Lord's Prayer? When he said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. We really need to change that. The way most of us pray, isn't it? It's, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. My will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that the way we pray? We tell what God what we want, and then we expect him to come through. That's not the way we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to pray and say, God, most of the time, I don't know what needs to happen here, but you do. So God, would you do what you want to do in this situation and clue me in when you know the time is right? so I can follow you, so I can do what you want me to do. But, but my whole point in telling you all this is that sometimes we have expectations in God, expecting God to do something God never said he would do, and then we're mad at God. That's amazing. We need to get in the book and see what God has to say about that. Okay, so now, the solution to getting rid of this anger that's the result of these misplaced expectations or these false expectations even in God is to place all your expectation in him only. Be sure that you're only expecting him to do what he said he would do and then don't expect anybody else to ever do what they say they will do. You say, that's a real negative view of life, but it'll keep you from being angry. You get that? Yeah. Girls have... He said he's going to be home at 5 o'clock, and you don't expect it. You say he's an idiot. He won't be here. Then he comes in at 5 o'clock. You'll be going, whoa, he did it. And you'll be happy. You get that? And if he doesn't come in at 5 o'clock, you're going to be saying, I knew I married an idiot. I knew he wouldn't be here. But you don't have to be angry. Do you get that? Put your expectations in the Lord, not in him or in anyone else. And then you don't have to be angry because of those misplaced expectations. Now, here's another one. Here's another one. This is hard for us to learn sometimes in America because you realize that in America, the affluence with which God has blessed us, the wealthiest people ever in human history, that's America, okay? And because of that affluence with which God has blessed this nation, we have become very materialistic. Isn't that true? We want, we want, we want, we want. And we want better, and we want better, and we want better, and we want it faster, and we want it faster, and we want it now. And then our culture comes along and helps us get it better and bigger and faster with the plastic industry. They're called credit cards. And as a result of that, record numbers of bankruptcies, a huge percentage of them due directly to, I gotta have it now and I can get it with this card and pay for it later. But oftentimes you can't pay for it later. You get that? It's this whole deal of materialism. It's this whole deal of what I call ownership. From the time we are little, little toddlers, we got this sin nature, and our culture feeds into that. You know what one of the first phrases most children learn to say is? It's mine. Sometimes the, one of the first five words they learn is, 
mine. Somebody else picks it up. Somebody, other, other kid comes along and picks it up. And what do they say? Mine. And if the other kid won't give it up, what do we got? We got a fight on our hands, right? We got anger boiling out of these little toddlers. Isn't that true? And listen, it doesn't stop when they grow up. We got this mine, this ownership mentality, and that often causes anger. That's another source of anger. If we fail to transfer ownership of everything that we possess to God, because let's go back to who we are as far as God is concerned. Slaves, right? Bought with a price, right out of the slave market of sin. And now Jesus is our new master, and he gives us all kinds of freedom because he's our new master, but he's still our master and we're still the slaves. Now let me ask you this. What do slaves own? Nothing. Everything the slave possesses is the property of the master who bought him. Slaves don't own anything. But if I'm claiming ownership to something, and then somebody messes with it, somebody tears it up, somebody damages it, what's going to happen? I'm going to be angry, right? You see, this, this failure of understanding ownership from God's perspective among God's people and failure to transfer ownership of everything that we have to God is a huge cause of anger. After all, when he bought us, he bought everything we possess. The word picture that Paul had in mind that he painted when he wrote, you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That word picture is of a slave who owns nothing everything belongs to the master who bought them jesus one time told a story that illustrates this principle this is what he said this is in matthew chapter 25 verses 14 to 15 he said the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants that's the word doulos he called his slaves and delivered get this delivered his goods to them. Hmm. So when the master was gone on this far journey, whose goods did the slaves possess and manage? His goods. Not their own. Who's our master? Jesus. Where is he? Gone on a far journey. He left earth and went back to heaven to prepare a place for us. And when he gets it all ready, he's going to come back again. And in the meantime, when he left us, he has delivered to us some of his goods. And we just manage his goods for him. It's, we don't own it. It's his. And we just manage it for him. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and these talents were gold coins, each according to his own ability. And then immediately he went on his journey. So it was his goods that his servants possessed. So here's what happens. If we still claim ownership of the things we possess, and someone steals it, misuses it, or damages it, then we will become angry. Isn't that true? Let me ask you this. Do you have to get angry if somebody steals a lawnmower of the fella across the street? You look out, you see them stealing that man's lawnmower, you might, as a good neighbor, call 911 and report it. But are you angry if they stole his lawnmower? You're thinking, man, I'm glad he didn't steal mine. You don't have to be angry if he steals his lawnmower, right? What if he steals your lawnmower and it's your lawnmower? You're probably going to be angry, right? You're probably going to be yelling and screaming and all kinds of stuff because it's yours. You see, you don't have to be angry if it's not yours. Do you get that? And so we need to understand that these slaves don't possess anything. Everything we have belongs to him. And so if somebody's messing with his stuff, the best thing to do is say, God, do you see what he's doing with your stuff? If I was you, I'd do something about that. And let God deal with it. You don't have to deal with it. You're just a slave. It's not yours. You don't have to be angry unless it belongs to you. If it belongs to you and you're a sinful human being, a fallen creature, you'll get angry every time. 
So you see, if we still claim ownership of the things that we possess, and then somebody either steals it or misuses it or damages it, then we're going to become angry. But when we recognize that everything we possess is actually his goods, then there is no reason for us to be angry when his goods are stolen or are misused or damaged because God can take care of his stuff a lot better than we can. I want to give you another one. Failure to transfer ownership to God, failure to realize that everything I possess actually belongs to him, failure to do that will keep you from doing something really, really important that God said to do. And in fact, this is the real test. This is the real test that God has given us to see if we own it or if he owns it. You know what the test is? You know what he said? If anyone asks to borrow from you, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to lend it to them, right? That's what he said. That's what Jesus told his disciples. If they want to borrow it, what? Lend it. You say, but he's an idiot. He will tear it up. He won't bring it back. He will do this. He'll sell it at the pawn shop. I know him. Right? But he comes over and he wants to buy it. If it's yours, what are you going to do? You're going to come up with all kinds of reasons not to let him have that. Isn't that true? And if it's yours, and then you feel a little guilty because Jesus said loan it to him, but it's yours, and so you go ahead and loan it to him, and then he tears it up or sells it at the pawn shop, then what's going to happen? You're going to be mad, and you're probably not only going to be mad at him, you're probably going to be mad at God because God's the one that said for you to loan it to him. You get that? But what if you realize it's God's and you just manage it for God? Can God tell you what to do with God's stuff? He can, can't he? I mean, it's his and yours are the slave. You're managing it. So God says, hey, when that idiot comes over to borrow that whatever, you loan it to him. You know, I say, oh, God, you don't understand that guy. We try to help God out sometimes, don't we? We need to clue God in. God, you, know, you may not know this, but that guy's not going to bring that back. He knows everything from the beginning to the end. You get that? And so if God says to you, that's my stuff, and I want you to loan it to him, then we just need to loan it to him. And we can do that if it's not ours. But what if it's ours? Mm, 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 mm. Then we don't want to do it. And if we do it, and they mess with it, and they don't bring it back, and they abuse it, they steal it, and what's going to happen to us? We're going to be really, really angry. You know where I find this most prevalent in America today? Automobiles. Right? With the development of the big box stores, with the acres and acres parking lot, with the narrow parking spaces, and you pull in there and park, and the sweet little lady pulls in there, she's 83 years old, she probably ought not to be driving, but she is. And she pulls in there, and she opens her car door, and she bashes it into your car or your truck, because we live in the South. What happens to you? You are angry, because that's your truck. What if it's God's truck? Do you have to be angry then? Let me give you an illustration like this. You're in the parking lot at Walmart, and about four spaces down is your buddy's pickup truck. And you see him get out of his pickup truck and bebop into Walmart. And the old lady comes and pulls in next to his truck. And she opens her car door and bashes his truck. Are you mad? Yeah. You're probably chuckling just a little, aren't you? See what she did to his truck? He's going to be mad when he gets back out here. Get that? And you're probably going to sit there and wait for him to come back out to watch. You get that? You don't have to be mad if it's his truck. You see, if it's God's truck, you don't have to be mad either. It's transfer of ownership. Transfer ownership of everything you have to God. And then when that happens, you can say, God, see what she did to your car? You might want to do something about that. You see your buddy's car down there? 
and it, it, his truck got bashed. And if you know that your buddy has transferred ownership of that to God, you can say, hey, God, did you see what they did to your truck? You get that? You can bypass all this anger. You can get rid of the anger if you begin to look at life from God's perspective. And so you see, when anger is the result of claiming, claiming ownership of his goods, then the solution to get rid of that anger is to transfer ownership of everything that you possess to its rightful owner. And who does own it? The Lord himself. After all, you're bought at a price, so all of your possessions are literally his possessions. They don't belong to you. You get that? Miss Jenny and I are in the rental business. And I know lots of people that say, oh, I could never be in the rental business. I'd be mad all the time. They tear up stuff. They do this. They don't pay their rent. They do something else. And that's true. But you know what happens? When me and Ms. We don't have a lot of problems. I mean, we have people that do all that stuff. But you know what? We expect them to tear it up when they move in. Get that? We just expect them to tear it up when they move in. We don't expect them to take care of it. If it's taken care of, we expect the Lord to take care of it, and he never said he would take care of all that. Get that? So when they tear it up, guess what? We just, they move out, and we go in expecting to have to fix it and do work on it. And we don't have to be mad because we didn't expect them to take care of it anyway. Get that? And then it's not ours. That house that we're renting to them is not ours anyway. The Lord loaned it to us so we could rent it out so we could have some supplemental income. So it's the Lord's house, and if the Lord chooses to allow them to tear his house up, whose business is that? That's his business, right? Could he have kept them from tearing his house up? Yep. You know what? If he lets them tear his house up, you know what that really is? That is a test for me to say, Whose house is it? Is it really the Lord's house or have you claimed ownership of it again? If I get mad, it's an indication that I'm owning it again and I need to give it back to him. You get that? So it's all about how you view life. It's all about if you understand how God views us and how we view life. That's what it's all about. So anytime you feel yourself about to get angry, number one, ask yourself now, what's happening here? What root cause is there? What is it that I'm expecting or what is it right that I'm claiming or what ownership am I dealing with here? It should be an indication to deal with a deeper problem. It should be a signal to show us we've got a deeper problem than the anger. Now here's another one. And this is the last one. And lots of times people don't like this one. It's taking up the offense of another. Taking up somebody else's offense. We tend to do this. It's quite common. Cause of anger. It's taking up the offense of someone else. God commands us to deal with offenses that are against us. You get that? What offenses is it your responsibility to deal with? When somebody has offended you. You get that? Here's how I know that. Jesus said this. It's in Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. And he goes on to tell you some more about that. But what kind of an offense are we dealing with here? An offense that's against who? You then it is your responsibility to deal with that offense. What if the offense is against somebody else? Somebody else that you care about. Somebody else that you love. Whose responsibility is it to deal with that offense? Their responsibility, not yours. But if you take up that responsibility, if you take ownership of a responsibility that is not yours, like dealing with their offense, you will be angry. You will still be angry long after that person got over it. You know why? God will give them grace to deal with that offense, but he won't give you grace to deal with their offense. And so they get over it, and you're still mad for months. And then you get a little bit angry at them because they got over it, and you're still mad. You ever been there? That's taking up somebody else's offense, and we're not supposed to do that. It is their offense, not your offense. 
And so that's what we need to understand. It's this whole idea of jurisdiction. I do not have the legal right to deal with somebody else's offense. They have to deal with that. You know what I'm supposed to do when I see that happen? I'm supposed to pray for the person who did the offending so that maybe he'll grow and not continue to do that to other people. And I'm supposed to pray for the person who is offended that they will op be open to receive enough of God's grace to deal with the offense the way God wants them to. Because if they don't deal with the offense the way God wants them to, guess what will happen? They'll become bitter. And Paul wrote to the Romans, beware lest a root of bitterness spring up in you and trouble you. And by that, many are defiled. You get that? So we're going to let them take care of that. How many of you, confession's good for the soul, right? How many of you are in my club where it's the club of people who have messed up with this in the past and been angry for a long time because of what someone did to someone else? You been there? Let me ask you this. Of those of you who have your hand up, uh, did the other person get over it before you did? You know why? God gives them grace to deal with it. They may or may not deal with it, but God gives them the grace to deal with it. He won't give you the grace to deal with their offense. So here's the conclusion. Not only does God want us to get rid of anger, he wants us to get rid of it quickly. The longer you stay angry, the worse the consequences for you. Get that? Somebody offends you and you're mad? Does that, have, does that affect them? Chances are it doesn't. They're going on their way saying, <laughs> you know, I really messed him over. They don't care if you're mad. But if you're angry and you don't deal with that anger, you don't get rid of that anger, what does it do to you? It'll just eat you up from the inside, won't it? It'll just cause all kinds of negative repercussions in your life. You know what happens to people who stay angry and turn bitter because of that? Ulcers, high blood pressure, stroke, heart attack, even arthritis. You know, arthritis is epidemic proportions in America today. You know, you know what the Bible says about arthritis? It, it ties it to bitterness. It says bitterness is like rottenness in the bones. What is bitterness? It's that lingering stuffed anger that poisons you from the inside out. And it says you'll be troubled. Beware lest a root of bitterness spring up in you and trouble you. And by that, many are defiled. So God wants us to deal with it quickly. Now, I want you to get this. This is really practical. Okay? Paul wrote this in Ephesians 4.26. In your anger, do not sin. You see, it's not a sin to be angry. It is a sin to stay angry past God's time limit, okay? Because he wants you to get rid of it. He wants you to deal with it, and he even gives us a time limit. You know, if God didn't give us a time limit, you know what we would do when we'd read those verses about get rid of your anger? We'd say, well, I'm going to one of these days. God knows us, doesn't he? Ten years from now, we're still angry. Well, I'm going to deal with it one of these days. I'm going to get rid of this. We never will unless God gives us a time limit. Then sometimes we don't. So in your anger, do not sin. So it is possible to sin when you're angry, right? Sin, anger itself is not the sin unless you let it go longer than God wants you to and don't deal with it. But how many of you have done some really stupid stuff when you were angry? <laughs> anger sure does promote sin. And so he says, in your anger, do not sin. And then, and then look, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. So you've got two choices. You either got to have enough power to stop the sun from setting, which I'm not sure any of you have, or you got to deal with the anger before the sun goes down. You got to get rid of it before the sun goes down. You know what that means? Maximum period of time that you have to deal with your anger, get rid of it, is 24 hours. If you get angry right after the sun goes down, you got 24 hours till the sun goes down again. What if you get angry right before the sun goes down? You better get with the program. 
because you don't have very much time. What if you get angry right after you get up in the morning? And this, yeah, you got 12 hours. Then maybe the, you know, right when you got up in the morning, you're trying to get ready and you're kind of dragging and you're in a bad mood anyway and the COD or the house manager or the house monitor or somebody else comes in and they're just really on your case because you're dragging behind and you get angry. How long you got to deal with that? 12 hours till the sun goes down. You see, God puts a time limit on how long we're supposed to stay angry without getting rid of it. He wants us to resolve our anger the same day that it occurs. If you get angry... <laughs> At any point in the day, you got till sundown to take care of that. Isn't that what the verse says? Now, in order to do so, we got to deal with those root causes. You can't deal with them if you don't know what they are, and that's why I gave them to you this morning. So here's what you got to do. You got to look at that angry anger and say, "What made me angry?" And then, if you realize that it's because I'm still claiming some personal right, I should get to sleep 15 minutes longer. Then. You got to surrender all those personal rights to the master because as slaves you have no rights you were bought at a price and then if you realize it's because some expectation wasn't met you thought you were going to go get to do this today and then there was a change of plans and the master decided you needed to do something else and your expectations weren't met then then you got to place all your expectations in the lord only not in some schedule, but in the Lord only. King David said, my expectation is from him. And then if you realize that that anger is caused because somebody messed with something that's yours, you own it, then you've got to transfer ownership of everything that you possess to Jesus, the rightful owner. After all, they are his goods. And then finally... If you realize that you're angry because of what somebody did, so the way somebody offended somebody that you care about, somebody else's offense, and you've taken that up, then you've got to refuse to take up that offense, and you've got to put it back down and let God deal with them about that. If your brother sins against you, then go and tell him it is fault between you and him alone. You only deal with that offense if it's your offense. So it is possible for people to get rid of all anger, however, what a tragedy it would be for you to live an anger-free life and then die and go to hell. What a tragedy, because I guarantee you, if you could just really get this all down, really deal with all these root causes, but have never really understood and believed the Jesus story, and you wind up in hell, you're going to be angry for all eternity.